here to present uh, product management lessons from founding a successful escape room. So a bit of background on me. I am a former economist from way back. And a few years ago, I left my job as a central banker in Sydney to found an escape room with one of my colleagues. And this was an amazing experience. We pulled something from the ground up in a matter of months and rose to uh, pretty successful levels. Uh, on TripAdvisor, for example, we were number three in fun and games. And more importantly, we became profitable and could pay the rent after only a few months. And so from there, I moved to Berlin and started a career in product management, I think because that founding experience really whet my appetite for it. And what I've realized subsequently is that actually a lot of what I learned from this escape room experience has been super useful to me as a product manager. Uh, the lessons I learned, the hard truths that I came to after having hit the wall, all has kind of shaped my PM experience. And I really wanted to share that with some other people, both as an inspiration and as a cautionary tale of don't fail the same way that I did. If nothing else, I hope this is kind of an interesting video full of fun anecdotes for you to follow along with about what it was like to found an escape room. So if you're joining me today, thanks very much. Nice to have you here. And I hope you enjoy the next 30 to 40 minutes of uh, Daniel stories. So before we start, here are the main takeaways. I'll leave them up on the screen for a second, not read them out. You've probably seen them before in the event description, but just a word on how the structure is going to go today. I've got about, I've got six different points that I want to cover. And rather than being a masterclass in here is exactly how you should found an escape room or here is exactly how you should be a product manager. I've treated this as kind of a conversation starter. Here are some high level points illustrated by a couple of anecdotes from my escape room experience as a way to open the conversation, open the discussion and get you thinking maybe in a certain different way. Some of them might be obvious to you and you might already have plenty of experience in them, but I'm hoping that at least one or two spark some new thoughts for you. And as I said, if nothing else, hopefully the stories about founding the escape room are fun and novel uh, for some of my listeners. So nice to have you here. If you have any thoughts, feedback, questions about what I've said tonight, please get in touch and I'd love to continue the conversation. So before we keep going, the roadmap uh, is, I've got these six points, which are number one on iteration. So this uh, OODA loop, more on that in a second. Second is we want to practice how we want to play. So isolation versus testing a feature, how it's going to be used. Third is this idea of razzle dazzle. Fourth is let's think about our features, about our products, in the context of what are they really doing? Why is the user, why is the customer really here? Fifth is the definition of what is your product? Where does that end? And sixth is talking about the hard stuff. When you fail, how should that look for the user? And how do you avoid angry emoji users? So hopefully with those six points, you'll find some interesting uh, tidbits or ideas going forward. Point number one then the OODA or OODA loop. Now you might've heard of this one before. It's a term popularized by military historian uh, Boyd. And it's kind of been floating around the internet for the last, I'd say 10 years or so in particular. And the meaning of it is, okay, so these four letters mean observe, orient, decide and act. And the idea is this is the loop you go through when you make decisions. And the tighter that loop is, the quicker you can change your decision-making based on new situations and the quicker you can get to the ideal scenario rather than being stuck, well, fighting yesterday's war, basically. And look, in product management, this is not new to us. We know this as iteration. The faster you can iterate, the more you can iterate, the quicker you can get to what a user really wants and what the business is really going to value. And I had an illustration of this from the escape room world, because I think it's not necessarily that obvious to people who make physical products that you can also iterate and you should iterate in this world, not just in the world of software. So the example I gave or the example I want to give you is even for your escape room puzzles, which are have got these physical components, you've got these locks that people are twiddling and, and wanting to open. 
even there, iteration is super important. So for example, our first room was full of puzzles that I just dreamt up from scratch and threw out into the world. And the advantage of this was like the early Mac Macintosh computers, because they'd all come out of one head, it had a very, very good internal consistency. The room hung together quite well as a closed system. However, because it had all only been tested in my head of, oh yeah, I would like that puzzle, many of the puzzles didn't really fit their purpose. For example, um, so we threw one of my favorite puzzles out there into the wild, testing on, at this stage, happily, it was just our beta testers, uh, some friends and family. It was a pretty novel puzzle and um, auditory puzzle because lots of escape room puzzles are these like very tactile, very visual based puzzles. Find these numbers and put them on the code, twiddle the lock, that sort of thing. So I wanted to challenge users to hear a series of uh, musical notes and then reproduce them using tuning forks tapped on a wall or tapped on the, the bench. Pretty easy, I thought. Listen to four notes, find the tuning forks around the room and then reproduce the puzzle by um, tapping the forks next to a, a kind of microphone. Turned out that was extremely wrong. Turned out that this puzzle was not only extremely difficult for people, it was also extraordinarily unfun. People just found it frustrating and painful to A, work out which notes they should tap and B, to figure out how to use the tuning forks. Tuning forks not being that common a household item if you haven't grown up in a super musical nerd family. So unfortunately, we had to throw out that puzzle, which is still a source of a little bit of sadness for me, but also pride. Because I mean, it illustrates really for me this commitment we had to rapid iteration, throw things out and not treat them as, yep, we're done, this is beautiful. Treat them as a perpetual beta. Okay, let's see if this puzzle works. If not, what's going wrong and how can we fix it? And so we figured out that the two main problems were musical notes are just a hard thing to take and reproduce. And then the mechanism by which we were expecting people to do that was just too hard. And so we changed the puzzle to be more like a recognize these sounds and then reproduce them just by tapping some buttons on a keyboard. It kept the core of the puzzle, this idea of an auditory puzzle, but it changed it into a format that was going to be fun and accessible for people. And this went great. People loved this. People loved the idea of a puzzle where they had to hear and they were able to engage with it. And so this, we only managed to do this because we shipped the, shipped the room, frankly, at a scarily unfinished point. Like we, we had all the puzzles ready, but they were very much in beta form with the idea of, okay, we're going to watch how people interact with these and work with these puzzles. And after every group of visitors, after every group of players, we're going to iterate on the puzzles that they found the most frustrating, or at least use their experience as a data point. And once we were pretty convinced that a puzzle was wrong, we're going to ship, um, change it out. And so we managed to do that in a physical products world where this involved being up until midnight, sometimes ripping things off the walls, changing locks and so on and so on. But it was worth it. It really meant that we took a room from, okay, this all works, but maybe it isn't perfect to a few short weeks later. Yeah, this is great. People are going to love this. And clearly people do love this because look, I just watched them come through. So the reason for the cat meme is if we were able to do this with a physical product, which involved literally gluing new stuff when we needed to change stuff out, what's your excuse with software? How come software iteration takes so long um, or how come your iteration cycles take so long if we were able to do it with the escape room in a matter of days? Something to think about for you. Iterate. Point number two is practice how you want to play is how I think of it in a sports metaphor setting or in a more scientific setting. Um, the laboratory is a bad place to see what's going to happen in the real world. So have you ever had something like this happen? You press the button expecting this great scene where the hospital explodes and no explosion. Things didn't happen. Your users were supposed to use this amazing new feature 
exactly how you wanted them to because you'd seen, I mean, I'm sure in the Batman movie, they tested this scene. I'm sure they did some controlled explosions and saw, yep, when you press that button, it's going to explode. And yet no plan survives contact with the enemy. In the real scene, in the real shooting, the thing didn't explode. And again, as I said, the point of this is laboratory conditions are very convenient for testing things, but they're not equal to the messy real world. We saw this in the context of the escape room. I had a lovely puzzle, again, one of my favorites, where you needed to, throughout your experience in the escape room, collect three different words. They also, the three different words were rest in peace, basically. And it led to a culmination, final, beautiful puzzle at the end where you entered that and something glorious happened. And because I'm a big smart ass, I wanted to call out this puzzle early and tease it to people. And so in an early room or in an early part of the room, I had little bits on the walls spelling out RIP, but I didn't want to make it super obvious by spell like writing out RIP. So I just kind of circled little letters in different places, R and I and P. Unfortunately though, what I didn't realize was, yes, in the end, this was a great call out to that puzzle, but in the short term, those those words, those letters, don't just spell out an acronym, they also spell out a verb. And that verb is rip, so tear, rend, pull things apart. And if you're in an escape room, people assume that things are there for a reason. So if they're told to rip, by God, they're going to rip things. And so we saw some players pulling up carpet, taking things off the walls, trying to tear books, all sort of behavior that not only was not expected, was definitely not wanted. Again, puzzle looked great in the laboratory. People who I tested it on when I said, look, if you saw this, would you understand in the end that it meant that it was hinting you towards the RIP puzzle? Yep, sounds good, great didn't survive contact with the messy real world because there were other conditions, there were other influences that derailed the intent and changed the ultimate outcome. All of which is to say, your user testing, looking at the feature on its own, studying how users understand this specific use case, great. Nothing compares and nothing will prepare you for having your feature in a general equilibrium where, okay, it's now embedded in your product and people will understand it based on its context within the broader product and honestly within its broader setting of on a phone, on a computer, whatever it is. And until you see that, you're not really going to be able to predict what's going to happen with your feature. So just be aware, the laboratory isn't equal to the real world. There's no substitute for getting down into the mud and saying, all right, as easy, (coughs) excuse me, as easy as it is to test my feature in the little user testing laboratory we've got in isolation, I guess we should do the hard yards of stick some sort of prototype in the broader product and see how it looks in the mess and the mud of the real situation. So I'd really encourage you avoid my mistake on this one. Try to avoid users pulling things off your walls test in the real context, practice how you want to play. All right, third point, razzle dazzle And this point is about acceptable versus delightful. Now, acceptable means the feature does as it's expected to. Like you have fulfilled the purpose, fit for purpose. But I would encourage you, I would challenge you here to not stop there if you can. And as often as you can, look for ways to make the same experience delightful, to ramp it up to 11 on the wow charts. And an illustration from the escape room, I think, explains why. So one of our puzzles there was a pretty standard, you solve some sort of puzzle, you solve some sort of, I think it was put numbers into something. And once you'd done so, it unlocked some artifact that you needed for another purpose. And the standard approach to this, one which I've seen in many other escape rooms, is to have some sort of box or um, some sort of like lock open audibly um, 
when you solve the puzzle. And so the players hear this click, hear this when the box opens and they go and find it. Okay, great. You have this cool new artifact. You can go do something with it. That's acceptable. That's a thumbs up. But we thought, my, found, my other founder and I, okay, that's fun, but how could we dial this up to 10 or 11 if possible? You know, it would be cool. Rather than just having a box open, pretty, pretty mundane. That happens to people all the time. Your mailbox opens like that. What if something descended from the heavens with this artifact once you'd unlocked the puzzle? And so that's what we did. <laughs> and it involved cutting bits out of the ceiling. It involved rigging up a little winch and pulley system. It involved a fair bit of engineering creativity. Aaron, if you're listening to this, well done with the engineering on this one. But what it, what it created for our users was such an amazing experience. So you can tell, you could tell this as well, by the way, from the reviews they left and from the reactions they gave after having gone through the room. So many of them called out how amazing it was to have this artifact descend from the ceiling after they'd solved this puzzle. That was one of the top things most groups mentioned. So this effort we went to to say, okay, you know what's cool? Descend from the heavens and have, I think we had Handel's Messiah, the uh, Hallelujah Chorus um, play at the same time. And we just went all out on this thing. And yes, it was a lot of effort, but the return on that effort in terms of delight and in terms of users just sort of stars coming out of their eyes and hence value to the business from these users going and telling their friends and just giving us raving five-star reviews on TripAdvisor was enormous. And if we just stopped it acceptable of artifacts comes out of a box, the escape room still would have hung together. But we'd, we'd have, we would have missed out on this opportunity to create so much delight and joy in the world and the opportunity to get all this free word of mouth advertising from these users who loved this puzzle. So, takeaway message from this one. Look for those fireworks. Look for a way. Okay, if I'm making this feature, what's acceptable? And then how could I make it not just acceptable, but delightful in every context you can? Because... It's the ability and it's the drive to find those moments of delight that I believe separate the adequate product managers from the amazing ones. Where can you put delight in your products? Point four, and little secret, this is my favorite point of the presentation. So if you're still with me now, I hope this will all be worth it then. This is the point, and it's, it's an obvious one in many ways, but I think it's overlooked in many contexts. And this is asking the question of, what's the real point of what I'm building here? Not just what's the name of the concept that I'm building. Let me explain that a little further. So let's think about the escape room again. Escape rooms are fundamentally rooms filled with puzzles. Cool. What's a puzzle? At its heart, at its mechanical heart, what it says on the box for a puzzle basically is that it's got a, it's a lock with a key, in, at least in the escape room context. It's something that is closed off that you can open up once you have the right key for it. And this can be a physical lock with a physical key, or it can be a physical lock with a sort of conceptual key, like put in numbers. Um, it can be a door that you need to open with a key. It can even be something electronic, like a computer telling you you can't get further until you know the right password or can solve this colored game or whatever. Fundamentally though, locks and keys. So that's what a puzzle is. And that's what I see a lot of escape rooms do. They think, okay, an escape room is basically a room filled with puzzles. So basically I need a room filled with a bunch of locks and keys. And each of those locks and keys, um, like leads to the next one. If I open one lock, then it opens up um, to give you the key to unlock the next lock and so on, so on. Wrong is my message here. I think this is, I mean, at a trivial level, obviously correct, but at a more important level, as Dr. Cox is saying, wrong, 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 wrong. So what's a better way of thinking about it? All right, Daniel, you're being very hyperbolic about this. Give me the, give me the good stuff. So what I think a puzzle 
is, is a way of creating a certain experience for a player. Because players don't come to your room, players don't pay a decent amount of money to go around and find a bunch of locks and unlock them. This is not a very fun experience described in those terms. What players pay for is an experience of finding something, grappling with it, thinking hard, not understanding it, being confused, almost getting to the point of frustration, and then suddenly eureka moments and feeling like a genius and being able to solve it straight away. The puzzle should become trivial once you've had that eureka moment. And thinking about it through this lens suddenly changes the definition of what needs to be in your room. It's not just locks and keys. It's opportunities, it's ways, it's means of giving this sort of experience to the user. And this has two components. And and sort of this led us in two directions, at least. One is that the puzzle experience needs to look like this. It needs to look like think hard, think hard, think hard, grapple, eureka, solve instantly rather than think, work it out, spend five minutes laboriously executing on the solution. Because the five minutes laboriously executing on the solution, ultimately, there's a place for that. I mean, Rubik's Cubes are mostly twiddling sides of of this thing. Even after you know what you're doing, you're going to spend most of your time turning sides. And that can be fun. But the more fun thing is the ramp up and then the Eureka, that's the flow state. And so that's what the puzzles need to be like. The hard bit needs to be the sol- that needs to be the working it out. And then the solving should be instant. The second, I think almost even more important revelation was that there are lots of ways to convey this sort of experience to users, not just an isolated puzzle of lock key. For example, Most escape rooms have a setup where it's, as I said before, um, you unlock one lock, which gives you the key to the next lock, which gives you the key to the next lock. Very A, B, C, linear progression of puzzles. What we we realized was that we can create this sort of meta experience of thinking, not understanding, eureka, um, at at the level of the structure of the room too. So what do I mean by that? We structured our room rather than as a linear progression, as a kind of branching path progression from the very start. From where you are at minute zero, you can already, as a playing group, go multiple ways. But we didn't call this out. We just let players go, figured out, let, let them figure it out for themselves. And so what tended to happen was they would figure out, or they would they would find one of the paths themselves, a random path usually. And then because they'd been conditioned by other escape rooms, they would follow down that path. Okay, (laughs) keep going, keep going. And that path would get harder and harder. And they still hadn't gone to either of the other two paths because it was was obvious from the start that those paths existed, existed. And then at some point, one of the players would go back to the starting area and start to look around and start to fiddle with things and unlock something new that was obviously a second path because, I mean, the rest of them are still working on this first path. And suddenly hit this eureka moment of, hold on, there's actually more ways that we could have gone and could be going right now in this room. And so they would go back and excitedly tell everyone else. And this, and there would be this individual eureka moment that then got translated into a group eureka moment of, holy crap, we can go and try a few new things. Let's go split up. And this was at the meta level. There was no individual puzzle associated with this that that eureka moment was at the level of how does this room, how does this world we've been put into fit together? And this was also a favorite moment of lots of players. Like we heard them comment afterwards of this branching uh, setup, this sudden realization that they could unlock these other, other parts of it was also a really fun bit. And I think we only came to that from thinking through what experience we're we're wanting to provide from kind of first principles rather than stopping at just the what's on the box puzzle equals lock plus key sort of level. So takeaway for you product management um, gurus or product managers in the audience is what are you building? What does it say on the box? 
But ultimately, what are you trying to create for the user? Why is the user really there? You're building a wish list, okay? A wish list is a bunch of items that you can mark with a heart or take the heart off. Cool, okay? That's what it says on the box. That's, you could just ship that. But why is a wish list? What is the user really trying to do there? Well, a wish list is a way of me teaching this product what I like, saving it for later, having the product store my preferences, having somewhere that I can um, put things so that I can show other people and have them persist across time and also persist across uh, across kind of individuals. And you can unpack like that's one layer and then you can unpack this to further layers. And the deeper down you go and the closer you get to this idea of what experience is the user wanting to have with this product, the more that you can jump straight to providing that experience rather than wish list equals set of items with a flag saying like, don't like, and stopping there. Soapbox over. Point is, try to get to what is the real point of what you're shipping here, uh, because it pays big dividends. Number five, uh, nobody puts product in a corner. So what's the definition of your product is my question motivating this part. Like, where's your product begin and end? My point, my answer to the, what is your product is that it's everything, 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 everything. I feel like you're probably a bit scared by now. So let me just calm down a little bit. What do I mean by everything and why am I on this particular rant? Well, what we learned from the escape room was we initially had been stuck in this mindset of, okay, where we need to focus our attention is this room here. Like there's literally, there was literally a physical boundary around, okay, this, once you go through this door, you're in the escape room. The puzzles need to work. You need to, the clock needs to turn on. Everything needs to be internally consistent here. And that's where we focused basically 90 to 95% of our attention. But what we realized very early on um, and confession, this is because we got it wrong, (laughs) Um, is that for players, their definition of what our product was started way earlier. So for many of them, it really started at that first interaction of booking it. Like how was the process of booking the room? How was the um, experience of knowing where to go, that sort of thing. And for almost everyone, even the ones who sort of abstracted from the booking process and just treated it as a, okay, this is another booking online experience. So it doesn't really affect me. All of them, all of our players considered the product, the experience at least to have started when they arrived at our building, not when they went into the room, their, their little mental clock, their little mental reviewer was already writing things down from the moment they tried to get into the reception area of the building. And we realized this because we had a challenging setup where we were in a commercial offices building, which was fine during the week because the doors were open and it was easy for users to get in and out. On the weekend, the place was deserted and the doors were locked by default. And so users often had trouble getting in because they'd come to the front and have no idea how to get through. And this is obviously not a fun experience. I mean you can, we made a few jokes and tried to pass it off as, hi, oh, you've passed the first challenge. You've solved the first puzzle, get into the room. But it was a bit of a weak uh, opening. And so we realized we really needed to up our game. We really need to embrace this idea of, okay, the, the room starts, the product starts from the front door um, of this building. And we don't have control over the front door, but we can shape... Um, how users interact with it by making sure that there's a really clear way to contact us that we have themed that way of saying welcome adventurers or whatever it was like let's lean into this idea if if users think that their their experience starts from here cool experience starts from there we're going to theme it we're going to make sure it's good we're going to make sure we're ready to catch their hand from that moment onwards Um, and that was a super important realization and if we hadn't stop to think about that and 
really embrace that. I suspect we would not have been nearly as successful and would not have got nearly as many um, happy reviews because, I mean, that first taste of ex- interacting with our company with our product just would have been a little bit soured by that. So I encourage you, when you ask like, what is my product? You don't really get to provide the answer to that question. Ultimately, your user provides the answer. Whatever they think of as part of your product, you damn well better make sure is as delightful as an experience as every other part of it. So let me encourage you, take the red pill on this one. Um, Don't think of your product as just the technology part of it. Don't think of your product as just what your engineers have shipped, anything like this. Your product is everything that your users have in their head about it. And that means that as a PM, you need to have your eyes on it too. How's the copy in my marketing uh, emails? How does the checkout experience um, feel? Even if I'm using a third-party provider for that, how does the um, delivery of my physical product feel? All this stuff, it's not code, Um, It's not something the engineers have shipped, but if the user associates it with your product, it's directly going to affect their perception of the whole thing. So take the red pill, get out of the world where you only think about features attached to code and enter enter the real world of your product is everything. All right, last point. Um, And this is my sort of... Um, cautionary tale again of when you fail, make sure that you have a way to fail gracefully. In an escape room setting, happily and sometimes extremely embarrassingly, when you fail, it is painfully obvious because by nature of escape rooms, there's always someone watching on the cameras Um, for various reasons, for safety reasons, but also because often escape rooms are built requiring human intervention occasionally to say, okay, release the hounds or whatever. So we had very visceral experiences with the escape room of seeing users try to use a puzzle and do what we thought and enter what we thought was the right solution and nothing happened. And there were a few nail biting moments with that. And we never got to the point where it was a disaster, but there were a few moments where we really had to lean on users' patience and um, (laughs) forgiveness and have have an escape room runner, a games master or mistress come into the room and switch out a puzzle and say, hey, pretend you've had this from (laughs) from the start. I'm so sorry. And usually because we treated them nicely from the start, and again, back to my earlier point, because we'd really dialed up the experience as much as we could from from word go, users were already primed to like us and to forgive us a lot of things. But goodness, these were embarrassing moments. And so what we learned very quickly was like, you're going to have this sort of moment. You're going to like anticipate an enormous slam dunk and just hit the ground. Uh, And what you want for it to happen is, okay, even if you've like had an epic pratfall, turn it like it needs to turn into something that looks more or less like you intended it to happen this guy looks like he might have intended to turn it like to fall over and like turn it into an epic um, guitar solo um and the way we did this was i like i my favorite example is like funny 404 pages the lego.com website has a great one like if they fail it's in a way that like saves the situation to the best extent they can. Like it's funny. It's sort of, uh, sorry. Like we know you've had a sort of semi bad experience here, but at least we have thought about this possible scenario. And here we've given you a link to get back to somewhere we intended you to be. Same thing with escape rooms. Like we needed to make sure that we had a plan B for all of the puzzles. Like if this is broken, what happens to the user? And ideally that plan B didn't involve the escape room, uh, the games master running in with an alternative. It involved it some sort of in world fallback scenario. And that's what we, that's what we spent a lot of our time doing in the sort of second round of iterations. After we'd got the, the room in good shape, users loved it. Our second highest priority was, okay, how do we fail gracefully in a way that 
ideally users might not even realize we've failed. They might sort of think, was that intentional? And then shrug and say, well, still worked. Maybe maybe that was what was intended. Um, clearly the 404 page isn't like that. The 404, you've hit a problem. Um, but at least it kind of guides you back in an elegant way. So those were our two hierarchies of either avoid users even realizing something has failed or second best fail in a forgivable kind of funny way rather than a, well, this sucks. Like my experience has just been ruined way. And this was super important because user who's had an acceptable experience because something has failed, but it's been, it's, it's either mostly invisible or it's ended up funny or what have you. They're fine. They're, they're still going to give you a four or maybe five star review. They're going to be okay. User who has had something blow up in their face or user who's been stuck waiting for 10 minutes while the games master has like gone in with a screwdriver to un- undo something. That's a user who's going to give you a one star review and potentially tell everyone they know not to go to your escape room. So failing gracefully should be an enormously high priority for you because just like turning an acceptable experience into a delightful one can really win you a lot of friends and good press, an acceptable experience going to a horrible one, that's a disaster. That can sink your product entirely. So avoiding that um, is pretty high priority. Fail gracefully. So those have been my six points. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the anecdotes uh, from my escape room. And I hope you have picked up a few ideas that you might want to take forward in your product management career. If you have any thoughts, if you saw anything you liked, if you'd like to ask me any questions, if you just wonder what the heck I do when I'm not recording videos about escape rooms, um, find me on Twitter, look at, look for me on LinkedIn. Um, I'd really love to get in touch with anyone who enjoys talking about this stuff, escape rooms, product management, funny 404 pages. I'm a friendly dude. Um, But otherwise, I really am grateful that you joined me tonight um, and hope to connect in the future. Take it easy.